Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse, one of the librarians at Empire State College. This video will help you understand the major differences between scholarly, popular, and trade, also known as professional, publications. You will learn how they differ in terms of who creates them, the audience that they're created for, their purpose, and how quality control is done. I will also show you how to tell the difference just by looking at them. The first important difference between scholarly, popular, and trade publications is who they're by. Scholarly sources are written by scholarly authors. These are people who are experts in the field that they're writing about. They usually have one or more PhDs. Occasionally, you'll see scholarly sources written by PhD candidates or people with master's degrees. On the other hand, popular sources are usually written by non-experts. Journalists and freelance writers make up a large percentage of the authors of popular sources. Occasionally, you'll see a popular publication about a certain topic written by an expert, but just because the author is a scholar doesn't make the article scholarly. I'll explain why in a minute. Trade magazines, also known as professional magazines or journals, are publications about skilled work that requires special knowledge and skills but people don't get advanced degrees in those fields. Examples are firefighting, hotel management, cosmetology, and selling sound equipment. Articles in trade journals are written by people with extensive training, experience, and relevant certifications in their fields, regardless of whether they have college degrees. I mentioned before that just because an article is written by a scholar doesn't mean it's scholarly. It's not only who wrote the article, but who it's written for. Scholarly articles and books are written for fellow experts in a specialized subject area. They're also read by college students who are taking courses in that subject area. Because they're intended for fellow experts, scholarly articles use advanced, specialized vocabulary without providing definitions. They don't do anything to help a beginner get up to speed. The language of a scholarly article is formal and complex. No one talks out loud like that. Scholars have to be taught to write that way, because when it's done right, it's more precise and detailed than regular speech. The content covered in scholarly publications is advanced, and it often fails to include explanations because the reader is expected to know those things already. You may end up needing to look things up. Popular publications are intended for a general audience. They are usually published for the purpose of making a profit, either by selling copies of books, or by getting people to look at advertisements. Because of that, they are written and formatted to appeal to as large an audience as possible, to grab people's attention and keep them turning pages. Some popular publications are intended for general interest. The language is casual and easy to read, and the topics are written with an expectation that the reader has very little or no previous knowledge of the subject. The topics that are chosen for articles are often based on current events, trends, and the ever-popular trio of sex, death, and the supernatural. Other popular sources are written for people with specific interests, such as popular mechanics, Asian art, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and National Geographic. This category also includes many nonfiction books. These sources assume a higher level of knowledge about the topics covered within the source. They still provide definitions of specialized vocabulary, and explanations of complicated concepts. While they're still tailored for readers who are not experts in the subject, these specialty popular magazines and books expect that if the reader was curious enough about the subject to pick up the magazine or book, they'll be willing to put a little effort into reading and understanding it. Trade magazines are intended for an audience of people who have the same job or are members of the same profession. Like scholarly sources, they expect their readers to have a specialized vocabulary of their field and to share a body of in-group knowledge that will allow them to understand advanced concepts in the articles without much explanation. Often their language is less formal than scholarly language. However, this isn't universally true. Some trade and professional sources are just as dense and difficult as scholarly ones. The third way that scholarly, popular, and trade publications differ is in how they handle quality control. Every publication has to maintain its reputation and keep up with its audience's expectations. 
But those expectations differ not only between scholarly and popular and trade, but also within different types of popular publications. Peer-reviewed is almost synonymous with scholarly, and that's because peer review is at the heart of scholarly communication. People don't read and write in a vacuum. It's an ongoing conversation, and peer review is what maintains shared standards like research ethics, valid research methods for the discipline, statistical validity, weeding out errors, and detecting fraud and misinformation before it gets published. The way peer review works is that when an author submits an article to a journal, the journal gives it a once-over, and if it seems like it's relevant to the journal's subject area, they send it to a few people who are experts in what the article is about. The experts don't know who the author is, and the author doesn't know who the peer reviewers are. That reduces the chances of bias. Of course, in real life, Sometimes there are only half a dozen experts in a tiny subject area, and they all know each other and can recognize each other through their writing styles. But the goal is to make the decision based on the merits of the article, not the author's existing reputation. The expert peer reviewers examine the article closely for errors, invalid research methods, bias, or ethical violations like plagiarism and research fraud. They also make suggestions about how to improve the writing or where a point needs to be clarified. They can make one of three decisions. Accept the article as is, accept the article if the author makes suggested changes, or reject the article. Some scholarly journals do editorial review instead of peer review. The difference is that instead of anonymous experts who are volunteers from the scholarly community, the journal employs a board of experts who are not anonymous. Otherwise, the process is the same. Editorial review is especially common in nursing journals. They are not technically peer-reviewed journals, but like peer-reviewed journals, they are scholarly. Refereed journals is a term that is used to cover both peer-reviewed and editorially reviewed journals. But at Empire State College, we prefer to say scholarly, because that seems to be what people are using anyway. Popular periodicals like magazines and newspapers have quality control too, but they don't have anything like peer review. They employ a staff of proofreaders and fact checkers to make sure that embarrassing mistakes don't make it into print. Better quality periodicals have better quality control. But an article in a popular magazine or newspaper about a research topic is probably based on a scholarly article somewhere, not on original research so their quality control assumes that the scholarly article was accurate, valid, and complete, and does not check their work. In addition, their proofreaders and fact-checkers may not fully understand the subject matter of the article, so while they can correct a misprint or a grammar error, they can't critique a flawed interpretation. Also remember that when popular magazines and newspapers report on current events, there are two sources for the information, investigative reporting, or information drawn from the newswires. Neither of these sources is infallible. If reporters and fact-checkers are getting bad information from their sources, it's not going to correct itself automatically. Also, in a scholarly publication, one of the quality standards is being uninfluenced by personal, political, and religious opinions. They also want research to be free of financial conflicts of interest, although this is challenging with the way research is funded in our society. Even though it might be impossible to be completely uninfluenced by financial conflicts of interest, scholarly journals themselves are not commercially funded, and they try to root out biased research as much as possible. In a popular publication, standards about bias may be much more lenient. In fact, many popular newspapers and magazines have a deliberate political or religious slant. Furthermore, almost all popular magazines and newspapers depend on advertisers for funding, and those advertisers sit on the board and have input into decisions about the publication's content and how it is presented. Quality control in trade or professional publications varies significantly. Some of them are very much like editorially reviewed journals. Others are more like high-quality popular magazines. There's not much more I can say without overgeneralizing. Do look at the advertisements in the journal. I'm sure you've read a magazine where on the left page there's an article about a certain issue, and on the right page there's a big glossy ad for a product that claims to solve that exact issue. For example, 
Closet Hell, How to Organize Your Life in a Weekend on the left side, and a California Closet Sad on the right. Look for this kind of thing in a trade or professional journal. If you see an article about how hard it is to weld widgets in bad weather, check if there's an Acme Winter Weather Welder 9000 on the page across from it. If you see it, be on the lookout for bias in the article. Another thing you're going to want to do is look at the letters to the editor section of the issue that came out after the one in which you found your article. Look to see if anyone wrote in with a correction or counterclaim. Letters to the editor can be an inconsistent but still valuable kind of after-the-fact peer review in trade journals. Some online trade journals may have a comment section in their articles, so look there too. Just beware that not everybody who submits a comment is an expert. And remember that while I've been talking mainly about journals, there are also scholarly, popular, and trade books that meet roughly the same criteria. If you're looking for scholarly articles in a database, you can limit your search to scholarly articles. You can do that either in advanced search, or you can wait until you get your list of search results, and then there will be a checkbox for you to click that hides the non-scholarly ones. Unfortunately, there's nothing like that to search for just trade articles, or just popular articles. You can also choose to search in a database that has only scholarly articles, like JSTOR or ScienceDirect, or only newspapers, like ProQuest newspapers. But, if you find an article out of context, you can still tell whether it's scholarly, popular, or trade, just by looking at it. A scholarly journal will not contain advertisements. Scholarly articles don't have gratuitous illustrations or decorative elements. The only graphics they'll have are charts, tables, graphs, and photographs to back up what they're saying in the text. Scholarly articles will have citations and a list of works cited or bibliography at the end. When you read a scholarly article, one of the first things you'll notice is the formal, complicated, and technical language. If you read it out loud and it sounds like conversational English, it's probably not a scholarly article. Do read it out loud if you're in a place where that's appropriate. Also print it out or make a copy and highlight important terms. On the back of each copied page, sum up the main ideas. One thing that is helpful with scholarly articles is that except for some essays in the humanities, they're organized in a very strict structure. They start out with a literature review, which is where they set you up with background information and context for their research. The literature review is a good place to find other authors who have written about the same subject. Then they'll talk about their research methods. Next, they'll describe what happened when they carried out those methods and give you the data. Finally, there's a conclusion section that interprets their findings and talks about how this changes our understanding of the subject. By the way, how a certain author's research changed everyone's understanding of a subject is exactly the kind of information you need when you're writing your own literature review. In the conclusion section, the author may also suggest further lines of inquiry, which can be useful if you're looking for a research topic of your own. You can probably identify a newspaper article on site. The columnar format with headlines is a tip-off. Even if it's reduced to a plain text file, you can still guess that it's a newspaper article based on how it is written. Newspaper journalists all use the upside-down pyramid model to write their articles. They don't know where their article will be cut off, so they deliberately put the most important information at the beginning and the least important information at the end. This is noticeably different from the flow of an article that's written as a story told from beginning to end, or an essay where one topic leads into another. A magazine article may be in any format, but you'll be able to tell that it's from a popular magazine because of the many advertisements, which take up about half the pages. Popular magazines want to get your attention and keep it, so they use many colorful pictures and graphic elements, which may not have much to do with supporting the textual content. They want to be accessible to as wide an audience as possible, including non-native speakers of English and people who haven't completed high school, so the language is easy. In certain specialized magazines, the language will be more challenging, but still not as formal and complicated as a scholarly journal. Since magazines are generally for leisure reading, their language may be casual and conversational. Another thing you'll notice is that no matter how in-depth the article goes into a topic, 
It will start you out at the beginning and give you the background information and definitions for the vocabulary that you need. Trade and professional journals will vary. They will have advertisements throughout, but they're usually ads for products, services, and conventions related to the trade. They may have illustrations, both content related and for the sake of looking good. The articles will expect the reader to have insider knowledge of the trade, but the language is still not as complicated and formal as a scholarly journal. There may be quite a lot of jargon, though. Trade journals may look dry and texty like a scholarly journal, or glossy and full of colorful pictures like a popular magazine. The way you know they're trade journals is that they're about the trade or profession and clearly targeted at members of that trade or profession. One last thing I'd like to talk about is that many instructors ask their students to find professional journals about a certain topic, when they actually mean scholarly or peer-reviewed journals. There is no such thing as a professional journal about philosophy or physics. Don't worry about it. Unless you're in a subject that could have both professional and scholarly journals, like sales or computer security, you'll be able to tell what the professor means from context. I've been talking about scholarly and popular and trade articles in journals, but the distinctions also exist in book publishing. Scholarly book publishers are university presses. They have the same peer review process as scholarly journals. Popular book presses are the type that you would see on the shelf at Barnes & Noble and they have editors and proofreaders whose quality control standards vary from laughable to excellent. Trade and professional books may have their own small publishing companies, which are usually affiliated with a trade or professional association. They may also come out through the commercial presses. Two kinds of things come up that many people think are scholarly, but they aren't. Technically speaking, while you can find scholarly articles or ebooks on the internet, either using a library database or Google Scholar. There is no such thing as a scholarly website. Just because a website has a .edu URL doesn't mean it's scholarly. Everyone who works and studies at a college has a web space with a .edu URL, and they can put anything up there that they want, with no quality control. And just because an expert with a PhD writes a blog, doesn't mean that the blog content goes through the same peer review process as their articles. Second, scholarly publishers can put out non-scholarly content on occasion. For example, scholarly journals routinely put out book reviews and letters to the editor, but those are not subject to the peer review process. And university presses often publish reference books and textbooks. They may be very high quality, but because they are tertiary sources, which means that they're based on other people's research rather than original research, they can't be considered scholarly. One thing that is completely excluded from the scholarly versus popular versus trade and professional schema is gray literature. Gray literature is unpublished material that can be found on the internet. It includes research data sets and reports. Sometimes these are very valuable sources that come from experts and are produced according to the highest standards. Their content is the kind that would be scholarly if they were peer-reviewed, but they're not peer-reviewed. Can you use this material as a scholarly research source? If it's put out there by an expert and seems legit, then maybe, but check with your instructor first. Scholarly communication is conducted as a conversation composed mainly of peer-reviewed articles. That conversation is how facts and theories are discovered, interpreted, transmitted, and evaluated. Part of college education is getting your feet wet in that world and learning its language and methods so you can participate on an equal footing and also so you can take its best practices, like valuing evidence and reason and civil debate, back into daily life. Why do we make such a big deal over the distinction between scholarly and non-scholarly sources? It does have something to do with quality control, but that is only part of a larger issue. As a college student, you are joining a network of scholarly communication. At first, you're a reader, and the research papers that you write are to help you learn. But sooner or later, your instructor may suggest to you that you submit one of your papers for publication. At that point, you're not just a reader, but a writer. Your paper was written based on the information and ideas you got from other articles. And you added your own information and ideas to it, which makes you a contributor to the scholarly conversation about your topic. If you continue and become known as an expert in your topic, a journal may approach you to become a peer reviewer as well. 
Scholarly communication is how new knowledge is created and integrated into existing knowledge, sometimes changing the whole way we view a subject. Everything about scholarly articles is tailored to help that happen, and to keep fraud, bias, wishful thinking, and mistakes from contaminating the process. It's not a perfect system, but it's the best one we have. So that's it for scholarly versus popular versus trade or professional sources. The key thing to remember about scholarly sources is that they're written for experts by experts, and they have the most rigorous system of quality control, which is known as peer review. Scholarly sources are part of the ongoing scholarly communication process about a subject, whereas popular sources are written to appeal to a general audience, often in order to make money, and have less consistently reliable quality control. Trade or professional sources are in the middle ground. Some of them are more like scholarly sources, and others are more like popular sources. You have to look at them case by case. Chances are, if your instructor or mentor asks you to get professional journals, they actually mean scholarly journals. As always, if you have any questions about this topic, or any other library or research related topic, go to http colon slash slash www.esc.edu slash ask a librarian.